Hello. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, so welcome back. So today we are going to discuss Grover's algorithm and then uh, we'll finish week four's material and move on to week five. And we'll talk about various applications, uh, this variational quantum eigensauber, et cetera. These are actually at the forefront of research. So I'm glad that we can get to that forefront in week five. I hope you are also excited about this. So let me use the slideshow. Okay, so there's one thing that uh, I did not have time to go over last time is the, the so-called gartesman neo no go theorem. Uh, this is something that talk about Clifford gates. So I, so I have to introduce the notion of Clifford gates, but the idea is simple. You have any unitary that transform poly product to another poly product. Uh, this is in the class of Clifford gates and these form a group. So they, they also call Clifford group. So example, Hartmut gate apply to poly sigma x is poly z, right? So you also have, for example, the C naught one two. If we apply to one two dagger, remember that this is related to uh, how the x is moved past to this. And we have this circuit equality. If you move X path through the CNA gate, you would actually bring out another X on the bottom. So this will be X1, X2. This is product of poly. So CNA H and actually a phase gate H, C naught, and S actually generate the Clipper group. So the upshot is that um, if we construct a quantum computer where we only use for example, the state preparation in the computational basis, like zero, zero, et cetera. Hardmark gate, H phase gate, control not, poly, and measurement in the poly group. For example, it's the measurement in the Z basis is the special case, but they can be rotated by the Hardmark and how the mark combined with the S gate. Unfortunately, if quantum computer only involving only these elements, they can be efficiently simulated on classical computer. So that's a no-go. This means that such quantum computations are not likely to be useful. Because I can use a classical computer and I can efficiently simulate that. So in order to break this no-go theorem, we need to have, we need to have gates that are not clipper. Okay, and we talk about universality. So universal gate, one of the non Clifford gate is this T gate. Okay. 
Uh, so that's an example. Or the Toffoli gate, if you remember, the Toffoli gate is the control, control, not gate. Okay, so if you have these non Clifford gates, then the no goal theorem cannot apply. That means a uh, circuit involving non Clifford gate may not necessarily be simulated efficiently on a classical computer. So this is important in order to have a quantum computer that potentially has some advantage. Okay, but this is just bring to your awareness that there is such restriction that we know certain subclass of circuit are not necessarily useful. Okay. So next I'm going to talk about Grover search algorithm. So imagine that you have a list of items. So we're going to label them by X. Now this X could be in our quantum computer, X1, X2, Xn, if we use n bit to represent that. And we want to search solutions such that f of x is one, for example, okay? So this could be a phone book. You want to find the person who has a telephone number 361, something like that. Um, yeah. So in general, this may not be a easy problem to solve. So the idea of Grover is that they use quantum computer and there are some n qubit that encode the object number, okay, and it's sent in. The working principle is that there is something called Oracle, which put a minus sign if X is a solution. So very similar to our phase kickback. In fact, the, the working principle of Oracle is that you send some kind of minus state and then you are doing some computation that add number to the second bit. Um, but you want to uh, implement that so that this is always the minus output and there is a phase kickback to that. And we've seen how this is done, right? So we just need to send in this. And then this is just the usual computation that add a, add the number. We just maybe just say this again. This is our usual F. So you send in B to the second register, but it would add F of X. Yeah. And so you can imprint, uh, from the discussion, you can forget about these uh, workspace. Just imagine that this is a, a phase kickback algorithm that put a mi minus sign on the solution. But you may ask, okay, it seems that the Oracle knows the solution because it put a minus sign. Uh, that means it seems the Oracle is really powerful. But the, actually that's not the case because even if you put a minus sign, you can uh, identify the object by measurement. So you need to do something better. And this is what Grover's algorithm. So it put the minus I and then it does the so-called reflection. So this is reflection respect to the mean. So the mean basically uh, means what is exactly the mean? The mean is if you describe a wave function, the mean is the average of alpha x, okay? So there's more detail here. So um, 
you can actually representing uh, one global iteration. So one global iteration consists of the Oracle putting a minus sign on the solution, followed by reflection around the mean. And this is actually a reflection for the Oracle itself. So two reflection combined is a rotation. So here I show uh, is a rotation you no know, way of understanding the Grover's algorithm. So let me just go through this. I may need to erase the annotations. So initially I set all the amplitude to be the same. So this means putting all the plus plus sign. So I did not normalize this in principle. The amplitude should be one over square root of two n if somehow the n object, this is the capital N is the number of object, total number of object. And then assuming two and seven are marked. So let me just make it bigger. So I'm assuming two and seven are marked are, are the two possible solutions. So what Oracle does is it reflect this two and seven, put a minus sign. So in this space of rotation, it's reflection. And the third step, let's see if I could, okay. I think I need to go back to original size. And then you do, so once you, once you mark minus sign, you do the reflection around the mean. So what I mean, by that is there is a mean value of these amplitude. So initially it's here, right? It's here. That's the mean value, but it's decreased a little bit because of a two negative component. So you reflect with respect to that. So when you reflect, that reflect down, that reflect up. So you see that the amplitude get changed, right? So the two that are the answer have a bigger amplitude relative to the other, right? The first step of reflection minus sign is still the same amplitude, but different sign. But once you do the reflection around the mean, these two become bigger. And then you do the ref, uh, the minus sign by Oracle. Uh, I think I, yeah, so this is the starting point, yeah. And then do the Oracle reflection. Yeah, the third, number three here is to do another minus sign flipping, right? So I'm here, these two positive peaks become a negative peaks. And then you do another so you calculate the mean and then do the reflection. And the arrow here representing rotation on a two dimensional plane. So one iteration of Grover is a rotation and it keep rotating to this. And you do another one, it keep rotating. So what's represented here is the non-solution, the space of non-solution. And the vertical line is the space of solutions. So you see that it get closer, it get closer to the solution space, and pass it a little bit and then uh, overshoot. And then it's, uh, it's, it's rotating on this circle. Okay, so that's the idea and the picture of Grover's algorithm. Any question on the procedure? Um, I'm going to explain the detail, but this is the picture. Okay, if not, then we go, go to the, uh, the next page. This is sort of a web-based interface implementation of two-step Grover. So for example, and, and I'm only using two qubit. So this here, the first part here is initialization. 
then you do uh, multiplication by minus sign uh, according to the solution. So here I'm assuming the solution is zero zero. So it doesn't uh, doesn't matter exactly how I implement this. It's supposed to be given by an oracle, but uh, with such a simple circuit, we hardcore uh, hard coded the uh, the oracle here, and then this is a reflection around the mean. So in more detail. Uh, the S is the superposition of all states, so meaning the plus 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 states, and reflection around the mean is two times that projector minus identity. And at the end, you perform the measurement. Okay. Uh, you can also use the Python code. Uh, if you know the circuit gate, you can really write it. So we'll go through some of the detail, but we have seen these, for example, and just illustrate. So I have Hardmap gate. So I say I have a quantum circuit. I apply the Hardmap gate to the qubit zero, apply Hardmap gate qubit one. And then I have a Oracle, which are which, which is uh, hardwired into the circuit. So, and this is the implementation, 2S gate. There might be other way of implementing, but 2S gate, hard map gate, and the control now from one to two. Actually, here I'm using zero and one because this is written on the notebook. And this is just illustration. I use a web base, I just drag the, the gate. So you have control nut, you have Hadama, and you have two S gates. And then this reflection around the mean, we really just uh, read the instruction from the gate and then turn it into code, right? At the end, you perform measurement, you say the circuit dot measure and quantum register, classical register. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so uh, I have a very old notebook. This is really old, uh, but if you're interested, you can you can download from this website. Uh, but they, later today, I'm going to explain a more recent implementation on, on other stuff, mostly uh, variational algorithm, which are really at the forefront of research nowadays. But let me continue to analyze the Grover. So uh, this is the first step. So it's putting a minus sign on, okay, I should say this is, um, okay, so this is X here is everything, every computational number, right? So I'm zero to two to the N, for example, and evaluate the F of, the number, item number, and if the if it is solution, if f of x is equal to one, then there's a minus sign, right? So I can also say that this is actually identity minus two times the mark item. This is just projector and ask, are you the x that's marked? So if this is x that's marked. Uh, first, you apply identity on yourself, so it's still X. And then, because you are a mark item, you are minus two times yourself, so this is a minus X. Okay, but if X is not marked, that means this has no effect. has no effect. So that means it's only identity acting on X. So this is basically a implementation of the Oracle, but you see that there's a, this minus sign is really a reflection. Okay, that's the first Oracle. 
The second step is reflection with respect to the mean. So as I already uh, shown, this is uh, two times the projector minus identity. Uh, it's similar to this, this format, but the, the sign is sort of flipped. But this is two times the projector of S. So S is basically superposition of everything uh, properly normalized. So this is two times the projector minus identity. And you all know that this can be obtained from Hardman gate acting on all zero. So I can I can rewrite this uh, to be a fixed reflection around around this zero here. So sometimes sometimes this is okay if sometimes you can you want to write this is fine because this is just overall phase. This is overall minus sign, which does not have any observable effect. Okay. So I mentioned the reflection around the mean. Uh, why is that? Uh, this is because let me first uh, erase. Okay, this is because any quantum state alpha, if I write in terms of decomposition AK times K state, after this operation US, I just write according to this. So it's two times the projector acting on alpha minus alpha itself because this is identity. You can see that uh, the alpha K, this coefficient alpha K goes to uh, something else, which is equal to, let me just say this is psi dot into K. So I'm just trying to find out its component and you, you see that there's a factor of N because the S projector has factor of N here. And then it's a summation because there's some over all possible, uh, all possible uh, state. So this is times the alpha J and sum over all the J and a minus alpha K. So you can see that this is really a um, two times the average minus cell. So that's a reflection. That's a reflection around the mean. Okay. So that this really is the physical picture. And these two, one and two are reflection. And we know the two reflection is a rotation. So in terms of the picture, let me make it bigger. In terms of picture, uh, here this axis represent the unmarked space. So I put all the unmarked states here along this axis. The other is the marked space. And the first, the first oracle action is a reflection around here, right? Because this is a mark space. If it's a mark, you will put a minus sign along all the stay in this direction. So that's a reflection with respect to the x axis, right? And then you do another reflection around the mean, which basically is, is here. So you do reflection around with respect to the s projector. So you move this arrow to this arrow. And this is reflection, so this angle is pi uh, theta over two, this one is also theta over two. Then the ref, uh, reflection around this give uh, angle theta. So you start from this S because you initialize in all superposition. One step of Grover algorithm is a rotation theta, okay? And this theta you can find by calculating the angle between the two. Basically it's a cosine or the inner product of the state to the unmarked state. And you find that the angle is, is in terms of the sine theta is, is this expression here. 
it's really just a simple calculation. And here you just keep track of how many are in the unmarked space and how many are in the marked space, right? So you have number of marked items. So this is the normalization. This is the number of unmarked items, okay? So that's the uh, geometry of the Grover's one step. And then the next question is, uh, as the picture show, it's a rotation, right? It keep rotating. Let's keep this arrow keep rotating. Uh, discrete rotation. So if it can get close to the vertical line, meaning the space of marked item very closely, but it could also overshoot. So how do we know when we should stop and then measure? So the idea is very simple. You just measure, how, you just count how many steps I should do in order to get close to the vertical axis. So here is pi over two, 90 degree, right? This is 90 degree. I started with half angle and I have theta angle. How many angle do I need? Like N is number of iteration times the angle plus half angle I already have. I want it to be as close as pi over two. Uh, the expression here, I assume if the total number of item is really large, then I can approximate the angle by this value here. And essentially the number of iteration is this expression. It turns out to be square root of N over number of mark item, okay? So for n equal to four, if you only have one marked item, actually the, this is exact. If you say this expression, number of iteration times the angle plus the initial theta over two equal to pi over two, exactly is you only need to have one step. N iteration is one. One step you can reach the item. This is because the theta is 60 degree so that's 30 degree and you add a 60 degree that goes to the vertical. So that's a very special case. Okay, any questions so far? It's quite geometrical, so it's not that difficult to understand. But the detail, you, you should verify the calculations. So you could end up here or it could be there but uh, there's also another question that if I don't know the, the number of mark item, how do, what, what would I do? I mean, if I know there's only one mark item, then this is the number of iteration is square root of n. So you can see the square root of n is better than classical computer. Because for n item, So n item. So on average, I may need to go through half of the items in order to know whether I find one or not, right? On average, if there's only one marked item. So there is a square root speed up or quadratic speed up with uh, respect to classical computer, okay? So that's the general speed up. It's not exponential, but it's, it's, it's better than nothing. Uh, and what about the question of the number of mark item is unknown. So the idea is that we have to estimate the angle, right? It all depends on the angle. So we need to estimate theta, uh, but to solve this solution, we need to go to the so-called quantum phase estimation, but this, uh, I'm not going to do that uh, today. So we'll be postponing this to later lecture. Basically, you need to, you need to find the eigenvalues of the rotation. Rotation, for example, you, you probably know that the rotation, if I write this way, This is a general rotation. 
has two eigenvalue. If I can estimate the, the phase, then, then I know the theta, right? Then I can go back and then directly calculate the n number of iteration. Okay. Any question? Okay. If not, uh, I'm going to slightly generalize the Grover's algorithm. And this is uh, called amplitude applications. If you don't understand the detail the first time, this is fine. So, but it, it's just easy to generalize by the formalism just to compare. So we do the Grover. This is one step, right? So this is one step and we have the, the Oracle put a minus sign. So basically it's a reflection of uh, respect to all the zero. Uh, yeah, sorry. This is, this is reflection with respect to the mark item. And then you have the reflection around the mean, which can be expanded in terms of reflection around zero. Okay. Uh, here is the Oracle. It's putting a minus sign on the mark item, but um, this is also a, a kind of reflection. Yeah, so I further expanded this US in terms of that, and that's how we get this, okay? And you know, notice that initial state is the Hadama gate acting on zero, right? And this is the Hadama gate, Hadama gate, and that's zero. So that's the relation. The zero that you use here, and this is the Hadama gate that I get to the state. Uh, the way to generalize is to generalize this formula. So F is still the same. Instead of Hadama, I actually have an A inverse operator. And then this is still the same reflection. And then A, A is the inverse of the A inverse here. So this is by comparison. So we start with zero and then we create some state. It's not necessary equal superposition, which was used in, in this Hadamard case. So we can generate, we can replace the Hadamard to A. And then we do this reflection. And then we sort of do the reverse of the, of the A inverse. Okay, so in this way, you can also see that if you do the good and bad uh, subspace as I indicated here, so this will be good. Sorry, this is bad subspace and this is good. This is where the answers are. So uh, they would be also rotation in this subspace. Okay, uh, because it's two-dimensional subspace, you could also uh, find the orthogonal of the size state here. It, so you can regard this rotation in this two-dimensional subspace spanned by good and bad, or the psi and psi bar. It's the initial, sort of the initial state and the orthogonal state. Okay, this is the formal generalization. So there's no that much restriction on what A is. Can be any unitary, as long as you can invert that easily. So this is the, the so-called amplitude amplification. So this is more general than Grover. Uh, amplitude amplification also is from the Grover, you see the picture, geometric picture, the amplitude in the beginning that I show. The amplitude of the solution are amplified. So this is in general, 
Grover is one of the example of amplitude amplification. Okay, any questions? Okay, if not, uh, I'm going to enter the main topic of this lecture. Yeah. And so the N, the K application is similar, it's just rotation. Okay, so let me open another. Can you see the new slide? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so I'm going to actually say that after this week's material, you can actually start doing some of the research using the uh, variation algorithm. So let me start by talking about complexity. So complexity essentially measure how long you need to solve a problem or maybe how much uh, memory space you need. So this is the usual thing that you've seen. You have a complexity class of P, which can be solved in polynomial time, meaning uh, the problem are really simple. But there's a bigger one called MP. It's called non-deterministic polynomial time. And that, the name doesn't matter, but what it means is that uh, these are the class of problem that might not be easy to find solution, but once you have a solution, it's easy to check. Check by hand or by a classical computer. Uh, among those problems, there is a special class called MP complete. This means that any MP problem uh, can be reduced to this. That's the meaning of complete, meaning that if you can solve this subclass, you can solve everything, everything inside MP. Okay, but now we have a quantum computer. How does the existence of quantum computer affect the complexity, the theory complexity? So we have to generate this. So first let's generate this to quantum and then they put together, see where they stand. So generalizing to the quantum world, the P, uh, is generated to the so-called BQP bounded quantum polynomial. The name it's just not so important, but the class of the problem means that these are the problem that quantum computer can solve efficiently, and the class of MP is generated to the quantum MP. We can regard this as quantum MP, but this the name is uh, invented by computer scientists. They call it QMA, Quantum Merlin Arthur. So MP complete is generated to QMA complete, meaning that any of the problem inside this QMA can be reduced to a special set of problems called QMA complete problems. And these things outside PQP are problems that quantum computer may not be able to solve efficiently. Okay. Yeah, so BQP, just remind, BQP is the class of problem that can be solved in polynomial time, polynomial in the number of input size by quantum computer. Uh, QMA, like MP, are the problem that may not necessarily be solved, but can be verified. So when you have a so solution, you put the solution into a quantum computer and it can verify whether you have the correct solution or not. Yeah, so if we put them together, this is how they, uh, the classical and quantum complexity classes are. So there's a P and there's MP, uh, dash line here, this oval is BQP, and this bigger dash line is QMA. The QMA, when you reduce the classical, it's MP, so it's this MP is contained in QMA, and P is contained in BQP. But exactly how they intersect is really not that uh, well known. 
uh, there's also in classical problem, there's also a complexity class of P space, meaning that if you are given a polynomial size of space, it could be memory, it could be disk, you can take however long exponential time to solve the problem. That means the problem inside here may generally be very difficult. Okay, this is a more rigorous definition of BQP, but it's not that important. The detail of one third or two thirds not that important. But because the difference with classical problem, the P is that quantum computer is a, a quantum machine that involves measurement and measurement usually is not uh, going to get some particular answer with 100%. So there's some probability there. So you need to allow that the quantum computer may fail to give you the answer some of the time, okay? But as long as it's finite probability, you can always amplify. Okay, uh, so that's really brief introduction to complexity class. Uh, classical and quantum, there are more. So there is actually a, a zoo of complexity. If you're interested, you can, you can look at what are the complex classes people have defined. Okay, so we can ask, now we have quantum computer, uh, what can we do? So this is a concept, quantum supremacy proposed by Pascal and others. So they, want to see that whether quantum computer can demonstrate something that classical computer can now do efficiently. So it's really a research problem and people have tried to find many problems that can be used to demonstrate quantum supremacy. And you might also have heard some news that Google has uh, carried out their machine and damaged something that they, they claim to have supremacy. Uh, at the time when people were trying to figure out the number of qubit that's needed. So it's about 50 qubits uh, were identified. It's roughly that you need to have more than 50 qubit in order to do something interesting. So this is also the reason why these company wanted to build quantum computer over 50 qubits. Um, there's also a notion called noisy intermediate scale quantum devices that refer to the current status of quantum computer because they are noisy and the size is not really large. So it means that if we want to do some error correction, we're going to talk about that quantum error correction in more detail later. But the idea is that these machines are so noisy, even if you do error quantum error correction, it uh, does not help. So it may be more limited uh, capability to, to demonstrate any of these uh, quantum supremacy. So what are the near-term applications? So that's a chart that Google, uh, they, they draw. Um, for small number, of qubit, we can simulate uh, efficiently using classical computer. And we are sort of at this region where it might be something non-trivial. Uh, of course, uh, if we have large number of qubit and the error rate is small, there's some, some line that uh, is a threshold if the gate error the rate of error is lower than that, and you can do uh, useful quantum error correction. But we are very far from that. In order to do that, you perhaps you need uh, millions of qubits, uh, which is really far from what we have now. We currently probably have about 100 qubit inside a, a single machine. So what kind of application can we do? Uh, so that's part of the today's subject. It's variational method to solve some interesting problem. Okay, so next slide. So uh, let me talk about general principle of variational method 
uh, particular, this is usually called variational quantum eigensolver in the context of quantum computing. But the idea is really simple. So you have a big matrix uh, in terms of physics is Hamiltonian. You want to find the lowest energy. It could also be different kind of optimization problem, whether you want to maximize maybe the gain of some something. You want to also minimize the time you spend, etc. If you can formulate that in terms of matrix, a big matrix, uh, you can write that lowest value being uh, a minimization over all possible vectors, right? Vector, and you evaluate this expectation value divided by norm. This is just normalization. And psi here is a vector which essentially has no constraint, of course it should be non-zero. But uh, this is, since this is a minimum you can gain, uh, if I choose a subclass of psi, this is represented here, psi theta is a subclass of vector, then it's upper bound, right? So it's upper bound. But the idea is I want to choose, uh, widely, uh, wisely choose a, a class of vectors so that I vary these parameters, I can get as close as to this minimum. So that's the essence of variational principle, okay? So VQE use uh, such an idea because our wave function is normalized. The quantum state is normal, so we generally do not write this. Okay, so, so what we want to do is if we can prepare, if we can prepare various different quantum state parameterized by a set of parameters, uh, we can perform measurement to estimate H. So that's this expectation value, okay. Because it may be difficult for a classical computer to evaluate such expectation value. So it'd be useful that we have a device that can carry out this for us. And then we can compare different parameters to see that which one is, is smaller, right? And we can even maybe find a gradient. It doesn't have to be gradient or any form of optimization, classical optimization. Some classical optimization for theta, okay? And that would allow us to find the next step. So for, for example, we may start with data zero and then by measuring that, and then we can maybe find the next step, and et cetera, and the final may be close to minimum. Okay, so that's the idea of variational quantum eigensolver. So any question? Any question on this point? Yeah, so we will repeat this in quantum computer and then classical optimization until the expectation value has uh, converged. So that's the idea. So we're going to see how we do that in quantum computer. So any question? Okay, perhaps it's uh, easiest to give a simple example. So the example is this uh, two by two matrix. So this is in terms of poly X and poly Z matrices with coefficient. You can imagine that this is a, a magnetic field and then there's some spin, and you want to find the most 
energetically favorable direction. Maybe it's anti aligned with the V field or something. Okay. So, as we said, we need to create a wave function. This is called, this is also called ANSAT. So, in this particular example, we will just start with zero and then we do rotation. This is the, remember the Euler rotation we talked about last time. So, in some sense, maybe we start with in the blocks up here, North Pole, and then we allow it to rotate to anywhere. And we, we will evaluate, we will evaluate the Hamiltonian. So how do we evaluate Hamiltonian? Because it involves two observables. So we need to measure the expectation value of sigma z and then sigma x. And expectation of sigma z, remember we talked about this in uh, the first week. This is really measurement. Uh, the the me measurement theory says that you put uh, the plus one for the zero outcome and you multiply the probability and you, you put a minus sign for the negative, uh, the one outcome and you weighted the probability. This is, this is the expectation value. If you repeat this procedure many times, this is what you should get. And you could also do this in, this is in plus minus basis. Okay. Yeah. So in terms of circuit, what you do is you prepare this and to measure sigma z, you just measure zero one. But to get the expectation value of this, you need to have an additional Hadamard gate and measure zero and one. Because in quantum computer, we fix the final measurement to be always in the zero one basis. Okay. So, uh, any question? So, I'm going to switch to notebook. So, maybe let me see if you have any question before I switch to the Jupyter notebook. Okay, if not, let me change the share screen. Can you see the notebook? Yes. yes. Okay, good. So, so first uh, we define the variational form. So we call that we have to start. So this is basically a definition of, of the quantum and classical register. And this is the quantum circuit. So I basically define a function that produce the circuit. Right? So this is a U3 rotation, right? The three parameter acting on, there's only one qubit, so qubit zero. And then I measure, right? This is in the, in order to measure the Z basis. And I also define another variation of form and X measurement. The difference, as I explained, is just this Hadamard gate, right? So that will return the quantum circuit that need to be run on quantum computer. Okay, so I'm just drawing this for you. So, so I have some angle. Uh, the X variational form is these ansatz and then perform Hadamard gate before I perform Z basis measurement. And this is the Z circuit. Okay, so as I said, uh, we need to get the probability distribution in order to uh, count the expectation value of sigma x and sigma z. So basically, when we read the outcome, uh, it's probably okay you can understand the conceptual, just treat these as some pseudo code is also possible. Um, we need to read out whether the measurement is zero and one, right? 
So you go through zero and one, okay? If, uh, if the measurement outcome does not contain the statistics of zero, then that means there's no, there's no, there's no outcome in zero. So you just put a uh, distribution being zero. Otherwise you put the number of counts. So basically the quantum computer will tell you zero, I measure how many, one I measure how many. So if zero is not listed, that means that uh, quantum computer did not measure any zero. So I put zero here. This is a simple two outcome measurement. So basically I just normalize by number of counts that I use and I just output that. So this is really just output the uh, distribution, which is a two component list, which uh, sum up to one. So the probability distribution. Okay, so next year I basically decided I want to use a simulator, this quantum assembly simulator, which what it does is basically run through the circuit and then measure zero and one. And it repeat that, uh, I said the number to be 10,000 times, okay? And remember the, the goal is to minimize the Hamiltonian and the Hamiltonian is this form. So I put the, the field only uh, Z and X component, so it's two component field. The energy will be the B, BZ times the Z sigma Z expectation value, which is obtained from the Z distribution, taking the zero probability minus one probability. And similarly for the X distribution, okay. Um, yeah, here, I define the objective function that I want to minimize. So basically this is the running through the first circuit to get the Z measurement and X measurement. And here I really just run the job. So I say execute two different circuit and back end basically means that this is the simulator that I want to run. I assign number of shot to be 10,000. So, and that's reading out the outcome from the job. And this is uh, outputting the two distribution, right? Once I have the distribution, I calculate the energy and return the cost. So basically this is the, the whole thing is encoded in this objective function. So basically I'm I'm hiding the quantum computation, the quantum computer, and in, in this these two lines. And okay, in, in these lines. Okay. It could be a classical computer that output this. But uh, we want to apply this to cases where classical computer may not be enough, may not have the capability to, to calculate this. But we use quantum computer for the outputting that statistics, okay? So that basically is the, the code. And this is just to run the simulation. So, okay. And remember there is a, there's an optimizer. So, so here it's only given a B field and the variational parameter, given one parameter, I find the cost. But I want to do it variationally to find the other parameter that I may minimize. So I define some optimizer. It's called Corbula. You can, you can look it up. Uh, it's not that important. There's some classical way of finding what's the next parameter. And I start with two random uh, component of magnetic field. Okay, I print this out. And I initialize some random parameter. Okay. Uh, yeah, so here, this is not, uh, I simply define that a function again here and with three parameter, because I don't want B field to be a parameter. Okay, this is for, for technical reason. Uh, I wanted to record the number of iteration and the values. Uh, so I define some function, this is not important because in the uh, NumPy implementation, only some 
specific optimizer allow you to do that. Um, I haven't figured out in general how to do that. Uh, I can only output the parameter, but not the evaluation, the count and mean. Uh, but you see that in the kiss kit, they actually package that very well. Okay, so this uh, is the optimizer is doing the variation. There are three variable and I'm using my objective function and some initial parameter. And this is the return of the optimizer. So remember we hide things uh, in quantum computational part actually in, in the objective function. Okay, so this is running the program and get the return of these parameter. So this would out, uh, give you the, what is the optimized parameter? Uh, then I have to evaluate. This is where I want to evaluate again, the number and the counts and get the probability distribution and get the energy. So this is just evaluate again. So evaluate, okay. So and I print down some of the information. So first I ran something random, random field. So I print out the B field and I perform 10,000 shots. And the estimated energy is from the optimization. And I evaluate that again to get the energy. Okay. Uh, that's what I get. And compared to the exact solutions, and the error is small. Uh, this is a simple problem. And this is a uh, sigma z expectation. And uh, these are the optimized parameter. Okay. Any question on this part of the course? Uh, if you understand conceptually what's doing, this is fine because you can use the code and modify and play, play the code see if you understand. And uh, there's a specific way of writing what, uh, the code. It's actually because of the design. Uh, so you just have to accept, for example, the circuit if you want to apply gate is circuit dot the gate and the parameter and the quantum register. But any question? Okay. Um, you can try other classical optimizer. So for example, uh, I do this again. Uh, instead of this corbula, so I do these minimize using these other optimizer that's, uh, that's uh, available in NumPy or SciPy. And uh, then I see how good that is. So it may vary. It depends on the classical optimization optimizer that you use. So the exact value, for example, one other example I did is minus 0.8 is the exact energy, but I only got these minus 0.76, uh, which still uh, differ quite a lot. Yeah. You can play with this code. Uh, you can, for example, you can take the, you can run through this and if it does not reach the optimal, you can run it again, take the converse value and use that as an initial point and to run and to see whether it converges further. Okay. Any question? So to write codes on your own may, may look complicated. You have to define so many things. But in fact, uh, in Qiskit, uh, already a lot of packages, uh, you have uh, built-in packages. So you simply load uh, these packages. So for example, uh, I can define the Hamiltonian that is an arbitrary combination of poly matrices. Um, but for the example that I 
uh, show you we only have two parameters, right? Only the B and C part. So I can define this as my BZ, BX Hamiltonian that I should obtain, okay? Uh, this is just specific way of assigning that using this dictionary. It's not that important. Just telling you the coefficient in front of identity, coefficient in front of Z, X, Y, etc. And then you convert that into operator, okay? But I'm reading that uh, from, from this function to get the Hamiltonian. Okay, this is where I, I said before, I want to record intermediate step, uh, which I sort of didn't do it very well in uh, the SciPy sci part, but the Qiskit actually embed that very well. So what I do, uh, remember I can just say, I want to do some variational algorithm. Uh, so I need some variational wave function. So there's a name called uh, RYRZ. Basically it's a RY rotation, RZ rotation. And if it's multiple qubit, you put some entangling gate, like control not gate. And it's a variational ansatz. And I choose the optimizer. Okay, this is the count that I want to keep track, value, parameter, deviation, etc. So I simply call VQE, that's already is in the package. So I call VQE, my Hamiltonian, what is my variational form? What is the classical optimizer that I want to use? If I want, I use the callback to store intermediate result. And I just denote this by VQE, okay and it's not yet run, you need to uh, call a back end. So we already uh, have a back end. I think it's uh, already used, so that's why I comment this out. So to run that, you have to, you just need to say, this is the name of your program, VQE run on what back end, okay? And I simply read out its eigenvalue. Oh, how do I, control Z. And I take the real part because the energy should be real. Uh, you see there are some errors. So warning, sorry, warning. Because the, uh, the KISS-KISS is ever evolving platform. They have been updating things. So if the package, uh, if the KISS-KISS version uh, is too old, then you will encounter a lot of uh, warning complaint that things will be uh, deprecated, etc. Okay. You can turn off the warning uh, in the Python. Um, yeah, so to get to the end. Okay, it's okay. There's no output. It's just simply run, run this to get the result. Then, uh, okay, then I compare with numerically solve that. So they also have they also have a package that you can just use uh, NumPy eigensolver to directly diagonalize the Hamiltonian. You just simply run that. This is a classical computed result. And you just read out the minimum eigenvalue. So I simply print out the VQE result here and the exact energy result. As you see that there are also some, some minor differences. It may also be the uh, classical optimizer that you use. It, it depends case by case. Okay. Uh, yeah. And I was trying to, I was trying to um, plot the in intermediate one. Uh, I think the one that I successfully ran was not recorded here, but I can, uh, I can update this to be so what I was supposed to, um, let me see if this is was run or I need to, I simply need to uh, import the matplotlib uh, in order to, to show this, okay. Uh, any questions? Let me see if I put 
calls. So these are some other. Let me see if I can uh, quickly fix that to show intermediate step. Okay, so yeah, there you go. So I need to load the, the plot software and I plot the number of counts and uh, the difference with the exact energy. So you see that it fluctuates back and forth. Uh, even intermediate steps, you can get better results. But I think if you, if you continue to run, it may converge. So it really depends on the classical optimizer you use, depends on the onset of wave function that you use. Any question? I should save this. Okay, if not, let's return to the slide. Okay. Yeah, so it's probably a good time to summarize this variational eigensauger. So you have a Hamiltonian. It could be some or, uh, or many terms. These HI, for example, can be product of poly because we usually turn that into poly operator. And there's some coefficient like the minus Vx minus Vz, et cetera. And for each turn, you need to have a circuit that you evaluate this. Evaluate, for example, sigma x, evaluate it sigma z, and then you need to have n such module to, to evaluate n terms. And then you do that separately, and you just combine the expectation value. And this just output to a classical computer and that the classical computer for you to decide which uh, which the new parameter you, you, you would use and you prepare the new state, you go to this again and have a different value and you loop this. Yeah, so that's the idea of variational quantum eigensauger. Okay, so I only use one qubit uh, in the example, but there are multiple, when there are multiple qubit, you also want to have uh, entangling gate as I indicated here. There are various uh, ansatz that was, uh, were provided in Qiskit, uh, at least 0.19 version, but they will actually be deprecated in later version. If you're using 0.20, there may be other alternatives, but uh, some of these, for example, the RY is you have Y rotation, Y rotation on these, and then you put uh, control not gay, control not gay. It can be linear. It could also be all to all. You could have any uh, control not between any two, two qubits. There's also RY, RZ. Uh, the difference is that there is one additional RZ K rotation. So these rotation angle theta, they are used as a parameter that you need to, need to optimize. And there's also another called swap RZ. You have, I guess, swap gate and then RZ rotation. Okay, so I guess we will not have time to do uh, uh, the illustration of the next, but I want to point out that we can, We'll do that next time, but I want to point out a problem that we're going to be considering next. So these are optimization problems, classical optimization problems. Uh, for example, it's called max cut. The idea is you want to separate uh, vertices in the, in, uh, in the graph so that uh, some classical expression is optimized. Okay, but uh, we can talk more detail on that. Uh, this will be more detailed next time. 
and then we also talk about uh, traveling salesman problem. I'm going to illustrate that uh, there already uh, Python notebook that's available. Uh, then I'll show you the demonstration. Uh, then uh, after that, I'm going to show you one very popular Anzab wave function called QLOA. This algorithm is called quantum approximate optimization algorithm. It's really one specific form of variational Anzab. Okay, so that's that's the Anzab, but I'm going to explain this just to give you overview. Uh, yeah. Then I'm going to show you some Qiskit implementation. Uh, if uh, I have time, I'm going to talk about sort of hybrid quantum classical neural network. So it's really the hot topic of quantum machine learning and it uses also classical, the best of classical learning plus the, the best of quantum computing to uh, engineer something called hybrid quantum classical approach. Yeah, so we also do some demonstration and other application, including molecular energy quantum chemistry. It would depend on how much time we have this week, or maybe we can take a half of the class on next Monday, uh, in addition to Wednesday. Uh, these are really at the forefront of research. You can see papers published on computing the energy of this. Yeah, so that would be the overview of what I plan to do. And um, really this actually bring you to the forefront of re current research, one of the research topic. Any questions? So I'm going to make the, the notebook available. So and you can download to your computer or upload to the code cal and then uh, run the cell. So I try to make uh, these notebook compatible with the kids get point one night version. Uh, yeah, because uh, some of us are still using that. I think including code cal they're still using uh, point 19 version. But for the newer version, you can directly download uh, from the kids get uh, GitHub page, those are updated to be compatible with the, the, the latest version. So any questions? Okay, if there's no further question, that's uh, end today's lecture here. I'll see you on Wednesday. Oh, let me see the question. Okay, there's no question. No question from the chat. Thank you. Thank you.